So for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet or who hasn't joined us on one of these calls previously, my name is Anna Burley. I am the policy officer for the Cooperative Party. Um, and since lockdown has begun, we have been hosting weekly cooperation live events and you've been joining us from the comforts of your sitting rooms or bedrooms or gardens or wherever it is you've, you've set up your computer um, in order to find out more about the cooperative movement and organisations that we work with um, and to engage in our policy thinking um, and to meet some of our elected representatives. So it's really nice to see some faces I've seen before um, but it's also lovely that we've got I think over 70 of you joined today, so lots of new people too. Um, I'm going to run through a bit of housekeeping. Um, the first is to let you know that we record these calls. Not everyone is able to join us on a Wednesday lunchtime, but they do value being able to catch up afterwards. And we put the video up on YouTube and circulate that link. So if you are in pyjamas or less, um, or you don't want to be recorded for whatever reason, you can turn off your video now. And don't let me... Uh, don't, don't let it be said I haven't given you sufficient warning um, if you are indecently attired. Uh, the other thing to let you know is that I will keep you all on mute for this call um, because it's very hard to hear speakers with lots of background noises from different people's uh, laptops and phones. Um, we will have a short amount of time for questions at the end. I've received some in advance. Thank you those who emailed some questions in. And I'm sure there'll be some questions that come up through the call itself. Um, the number of questions we take will be very dependent on how much time we have left. So if you do ask a question later, please, please, please keep it as short as possible. Um, conciseness will be rewarded and um, it will help us get through a lot more on this call. Um, in order to ask a question, and you're able to have a practice now if you haven't used Zoom before, there is the opportunity to put your hand up virtually. What you need to do, you go down to the bottom of your screen and there should be a participate button or a participant. In there, there is an option to put your hand up. Judy Saunders, I see your hand is up, very good. Um, so if you want to give it a go, um, you can stick your hand up and you can see how that works. Because there's so many of you, I can't see you all on one screen. Um, and putting your hand up puts you up to the top of the list I've got on the right hand side of the page. If you wanna ask a question and you can't find that button, I mean, you're welcome to wave your arms or, or put your hand up in, in real life, the chances are I might not see you. So do give it a go virtually. Hazel, Therese, Joe, Norman, Mark, yes, it's working, fabulous. Um, you can also, as David Reed just did, there's a reactions button. And if you can't find the participate one, you can do a, a clap or a thumbs up and that lets me know that you want to, to say something as well. Um, I'll unmute you to ask the question and then I'll, I'll keep you muted again. So that is my very basic housekeeping. Um, we are still waiting on Matt Rodder to join us. He's slightly late, uh, delayed, but I am really thrilled that we have Bill Freeman from the Community Transport Association to help kick us off. Um, so in all parts of the UK, every day of the year, thousands of community transport staff and volunteers help people to stay independent, participate in their communities and access vital public services and employment. The Community Transport Association is a national charity that represents and supports these organisations, mixture of charities, community groups, schools, other organisations who provide these inclusive transport services. Uh, Bill has been CEO of the Community Transport Association since 2013. And before that, he was Director of Services and Business Development at the National Association for Voluntary and Community Action. So a great heritage in bottom up change making um, and a lot of expertise joining us on this call today. So I will hand over to Bill. Bill is going to be sharing his screen. So you should see a presentation very shortly. Um, I will keep my eye on our list of participants. So if there are any issues, I should be able to pick them up um, as and when. But otherwise, I'm going to hand straight over to Bill, who is unmuted. And I look forward to hearing from him. Thanks, Anna. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, taking part today. It's, uh, Really good to uh, take part in events with the co-op party. Um, I've appreciated their support and uh, over the years in helping me understand about how transport can be done completely differently um, and uh, very much uh, welcome uh, the opportunity to speak to you today. So I've got some slides to go through. I'm um, been asked to talk about a number of things. One is to look at 
Well, how, how are services provided today? Uh, the current transport market, what does that look like? Um, where community transport fits in? Uh, some information about what's happening right now with uh, COVID and the uh, current response to that. And then some thoughts about the future, uh, which have been there uh, for some time uh, as thoughts for the future, but obviously we need to look at them in a new context now as uh, COVID-19 has a potential to reshape how we think and do certain things. Um, clearly, uh, I can't do a lot on all of those things in 10 minutes. I intend to uh, just whiz through some slides, can take any questions. You'll have all this information afterwards and happy to engage with anyone uh, that wants to uh, afterwards. So let's look at, uh, well, how do we travel today? Well, not literally today uh, with uh, us, uh, many of us having to limit the journeys we make on public transport. Um, to those that are essential. When we look at our transport market, um, there's a strong sense amongst many stakeholders that it's broken and doesn't quite work for everyone. Um, it probably is seen to work for the five companies that make up 70% of the market, but even they say it's not great. Um, we saw a commitment from Labour, it's manifesto at the end of last year, the general election, um, to intervene in the bus market more to take back uh, public ownership of local services or provide the means for that to happen if that's what local authorities want us to do and recently we've seen government announcements about uh, major investments in the bus market but actually those systemic uh, structural problems about a bus market uh, are still there in terms of the way in which it's organized the way in which local people can't really have a say over what their local transport looks like and very little leadership um, over that uh, from government Taxi market, um, not going to dwell too much on this other than to say, you know, co-ops are already in existence in the taxi market. Um, the lens we look at things through is how do these things work for people with mobility difficulties and, you know, on the whole that's done on a borough by borough basis. So whether you've got wheelchair accessible vehicles, the requirement for disability access training, you know, that varies largely dependent on where you live. Um, so community transport, where do we fit in? i say there's four features we would talk about. One is that of being uh, social provision. So it's about social need. Um, there's a not-for-profit business model that enables that, makes it more resilient and reliable. Um, personalized services tend to be targeted, especially for vulnerable people, those that are isolated. And they're also often demand responsive. So we'll take people door to door rather than being fixed scheduled services. Uh, very localized, our network of hundreds of operators are all uh, locally owned uh, groups uh, trying to do something in their local area, well connected with their local public bodies or the civil society organizations. And then that final point about being communal, um, that ability to mobilize community resources and assets, volunteer time, uh, donations from the public, make the links uh, in people and places and understanding those local priorities um, are four sort of key features that we would see. We look at how community transport intervenes in some of the, intervenes in some of the markets I've talked about. Um, there's models, you know, if you look at how public transport is organised in Jersey, where a social enterprise runs the whole bus network, seen massive increases since they took over. This was a process that enabled them to put their own model of how they would run the network across, building on their expertise. And it's, if we see the move towards franchising in the UK, if that's going to succeed, then some of those hallmarks that they cite in terms of operator innovation in the network design, the scheduling, the ticketing, that has to be something we can learn from. We already have buses uh, uh, that are run on a fixed and scheduled service on a not-for-profit basis. So the, the, the legislation is already there for there to be not-for-profit bus routes. It doesn't have to be done commercially by the commercial sector. Um, there's a small, you know, couple of hundred organisations do this already in different towns, villages across the UK. Um, and we've got uh, other parts of Europe, particularly the Netherlands, where uh, these services are integrated in with mainstream bus networks. Demand responsive transports, the door-to-door -door stuff, We've been left to this for years by the commercial sector because it's needed a lot of subsidy and that's been made viable by the kind of 
funds we can generate and volunteer involvement and also not having to pay dividends. But actually the commercial sector is getting more into this now because technology is enabling them to mimic that kind of localized, personalized approach that you get from a, a local service, but they're doing it at scale um, using technology platforms for that. There's some examples of employee-led models in there, but not much. These are essentially the bus companies turning their hands to something else uh, to sort of develop their businesses. So what are some of the challenges facing community transport? Obviously, financial sustainability, changing government policies and priorities. So there has been a big focus on investment in the bus market recently. Most of that won't find its way to community transport. Actually, community transport's not even in the last ministerial reshuffle, it was taken out of a bus minister's uh, portfolio. So it's a question of uh, how interesting and important the government does see community transport. We get a lot of support from them, but in terms of new policy, new investment, there's not been much in recent years. We're seeing commercial involvement in the social transport space, so more and more commercial organisations trying to do some of the work that community transport does, but not all of it. And actually, if they only do some of the work, that leaves those organisations left with some of the work in a precarious position because they can't piece together a business model to run their organisations without the full range of the activity that they currently provide. It's a bit of a tech deficit, so uh, we've been slow to engage and catch up with the use of technology in managing services. And um, I could spend all day talking about this, but the, there's been some uh, challenges to how the legal framework for community transport works that has meant uh, we've been having for the last two years think about whether we all need to shift to a different operating model. Fortunately, it's not come to that, but there's still some big regulatory questions facing a lot of organisations about what permit regime they ought to be working under. Okay, how's COVID affecting these services? Um, the blue column on my slide is what people would typically do. So things like group hire, door-to-door -door services, uh, car schemes, community bus services. So this was a sample of 195 organisations um, that answered a survey last month or earlier in this month, sorry. Um, so you can see the blue column, that's what they normally do. And then we asked them what have you done in the last seven days? And you can quite clearly see there's been a big drop off, particularly in some of the services where they would be um, picking up passengers um, and the group hire, because no one's running trips now, nobody's hiring a vehicle to go out. So that's having a massive impact on their finances and their operating model. We also asked, where do you take people? That's what they would normally do. So social activities or what would, what, we also asked them, do you do anything like prescriptions, delivering food, that sort of thing. So normal times, that's what they would do. Currently, as you'll see, a lot of them have switched away from their normal services and are now offering telephone support, collecting prescriptions, working with pharmacies, working with food banks to deliver food. So there's been a real shift away from providing transport services to using the infrastructure they've got as part of the local mobilization to keep people that are isolated, um, connected, and also supplied with food and essentials like medicine. Okay, we also asked them about how they normally get their funding. So as you can see from this chart, uh, of those respondents, a lot of them are relying on donations, fair income, uh, the bus service operators grant, have a focus on uh, local authority contracts and grants. We then asked them, how secure do you think that funding is? As you can see in my uh, red, amber, green rating, a large proportion of organisations felt that their fair income and donations was at risk, particularly if you're not delivering services that rely on some element of fares. They actually felt their local authority grants and contracts were uh, quite well protected and there's been some good action there from local authorities to say, well, we're gonna stand over those contracts. So even if you do deliver home to school contract and aren't taking kids to school at the moment, we're still gonna pay all of that or a significant proportion of that, which has been positive. Final slide on COVID. Uh, we asked them what they're doing to sustain themselves during this period. A lot are using reserves, some are using the furlough scheme. Um, and some are uh, you know, just collaborating with other organizations, hoping for an additional government funding scheme and relying on 
a little bit more from their local authorities that we, they work with as well. We also asked how it's impacting on staff and as you can see uh, large numbers are experiencing staff and volunteers that self-isolating. Um, age profile of many of our volunteers means that you know there's a significant number that have been you know told to stay at home for 12 weeks. Um, some have actually seen reported some new volunteers coming forward which is positive. Okay final thing some thoughts about the future. So what was I thinking about before all this started kicking off? Um, I think if we imagine uh, better local networks where things are more integrated uh, that can meet more needs then we need to work out how we can get there and I think it's getting better collaboration in the commissioning and provision of services can meet more needs in a better more integrated way and we're seeing some of that today in how different parties are working together in response to this crisis a total transport approach uh, if we look at public sector funding for transport, we'd actually pool all these resources and find a better way to uh, work with a network of providers to meet a range of provision. We've got different parts of councils all commissioning their own transport in slightly different ways and a large number of providers kind of scrapping it out for those small scale contracts. I'm not advocating one big contract that goes to one big company because actually I want to see a plural plurality of provision as well. There is potential for more community owned models and to combine community transport with different shared modes and the mainstream network. The Bus Services Act gave local leaders the tools to reshape local bus networks. There's not been uh, many proposed uses of it. Greater Manchester is the first to move towards franchising. We need to see some of these innovative models like the one I mentioned in Jersey. Where actually we've got a plurality of provision, the more community based not for profit services. And that approach needs to be non-prescriptive. We can't just still work on a route where we're going to prescribe all the routes and ask people or all the contracts and ask people to fulfill those. Actually, a lot of the operators know best about how to manage and run a network. I think some of the labels we use might be less useful in future, but actually that sense that we need something that's in the public realm that we feel we own and can do something about if we don't like it, uh, there should be that and a relentless focus on how our transport networks create public social value. We need to invest in and grow the models that deliver that. Where's that working? Good, well, Greater Manchester. So uh, two things have happened there recently. One was the consultation on franchising, the other was the Cooperative Commission. Actually, the combination of these two things could be really powerful in seeing a different kind of transport network a different kind of provider as part of that network. So I think we can, you know, like in many things, uh, look to Manchester for, for leadership there. But it's also seeing that big picture. How do you, you know, if you're going to intervene in the bus market, you've got to think about, well, what's that mean for social care? What does that mean for taxis, private hire? What does it mean for rail? Um, how do we uh, get people to car share? How do we make sure that people are using greener vehicles and we incentivize that? How do we penalize car use? So actually, the, the worst thing I can do is try and drive into town in my own private car. Um, that, that kind of leadership can only kind of come at this scale. But actually, you, know, you can see that it could work in county council areas um, as well. So it's not just something for big urban areas, these ideas. Actually, that better, more integrated system that meets more needs uh, can, can work in many other contexts too. So to finish, I think we need a stronger role for communities in our transport networks. People not just having a say, but having a go at running transport for themselves. It will help transport be more accessible and inclusive. We can manage demand better, get people out of their cars. It can actually make public money go further and build some local economic resilience. So it's essential towards community wealth building. Actually, if we're gonna try and change how our local economies work, then transport has to be part of that. I repeat something I said earlier, our transport network doesn't always feel like something that we own and can do something about. And I think that's what we need to create. And we do that by getting more community organizations, more citizens led initiatives, um, and actually move away from some of the models we've relied upon as a means of organizing our local transport. Thank you. Fabulous, I'll just unmute myself. So if Bill stops screen sharing. 
Lovely, I've got you all back and I spotted Matt Rodder, so I'm going to unmute Matt and welcome him. Um, Matt is the MP for Reading East, so not very far from the other Reading seat that we, we hoped we would have a, a Labour and Cooperative gain, so a good friend of the party. And he is a former journalist and former civil servant, but is currently Shadow Minister for Transport um, with a real focus on buses. So hopefully, Matt, you are able to say hello and we'd love to hear from you. Hi, Anna. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, great. Yeah, well, I'm delighted to be here and thank you very much for the invite to um, come and speak to people today. And I'm absolutely delighted to be reappointed as the Shadow Buses Minister um, and uh, very keen to be you know, pleased to be working for Jim McMahon and with other colleagues on this. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about the importance of community transport and then to perhaps uh, respond to some of the um, points that um, Bill made earlier. Um, community transport quite clearly is hugely important, both in the current crisis, and I should give a little plug for Readybus, which is our local um, community transport uh, organisation, and my colleague Rose Williams, who used to be on the council in Reading together, who's on the call, will never forgive me if I didn't say something about Readybus. So um, I think it's important to um, flag up what operators are doing at this difficult time, supporting vulnerable people, helping get food deliveries out, and also getting people in and out of hospital who can't make it themselves, a whole range of other things they're doing, all incredibly valuable at a time of, um, a, let's face it, national crisis, where the transport infrastructure is under a lot of pressure. There's a lot of uh, staff off sick in the um, different bus operators um, and across the rail system, and services have quite rightly been reduced to allow for social distancing. Um, and I, I think going forward, we need to try and find a new place for community transport that's more, hopefully, has a slightly higher profile, more value, than we pick up on some of the points that were mentioned earlier. Um, so if I can just um, perhaps refer to the overall importance of community transport in general as well, and then pick up on some of the points looking to the future. So I think that uh, it, hopefully it's acknowledged, certainly by everybody on this call today, but by a wider group, that community transport's got a huge amount to offer, particularly with a, an aging society, more um, challenges for our communities, it's got a really big contribution to make um, and I'm certainly very aware of that. I, I do hope that we can find a way as an opposition party of critiquing the government on this because they haven't really supported the sector in my opinion in the way they should have done and also looking to a much better future where um, as Bill was saying earlier we try to incentivize really innovative community-based organizations many of them will be co-ops or other community groups that are closely in touch with uh, people living out in the community and are often co-producing services with them so that those community transport services are much more appropriate to the needs of local people. It's a really granular and very like, hyper-local local level, I think you could almost say. Um, I do think there's some technical um, developments which are really quite exciting. If you look at um, the way that companies like Uber have developed, I'm not obviously a big fan of them, but the technology, the idea that you can um, share um, through a new technology demand for um, transport services and help help services adapt in real time can be quite exciting and there have been examples around the world where that data instead of being held by a private company is shared in the community and as a result much better services have been developed and I think that's I mean this isn't official labour policy at the moment, but I think personally as a shadow minister that's hugely exciting I'm very keen to work with others on that um, and in fact one of the things I should say please send me your ideas for how we can develop better community transport because at the moment we're in a very much in a policy development phase but as well as the newer technology, there's a whole lot of other things that are quite exciting which are coming along, like the wider integration of transport um, networks, the new powers for mayors in particular. We'd like all, all uh, local authorities to have the ability to franchise and to set up municipal bus companies. And obviously there can be kind of integration between um, some of those companies and um, community transport potentially. So we see that there's, there's some real opportunities there. Um, and there are other benefits as well. I think it's quite clear that we have to, as a society, move away from being so car dependent, both in terms of where we live, that we can have more, hopefully have more regeneration in, in existing urban areas, but also that we need to think about how we plan our day a little bit more as we tackle climate change and we try to move towards um, less use of cars, more use of buses, more use of public transport, more use of cycling, walking, and also using shared community services as part of that. Um, and when you combine that with electrification of buses or um, other, other forms of transport, it's quite exciting. And there's lots of really great opportunities there. So without going on into too much detail on that, I think that's something I hope you all would agree with. Um, in terms of the points that Bill made for the immediate future, 
I do think that it's down to us to really develop some exciting ideas about how this could be taken forward. And I want to start a dialogue with you. Um, so I'd very much like people to send me their contact details afterwards, if I can circulate my email later, and to have an ongoing discussion. And when we're out of lockdown, I'd very much like to visit you in different parts of the country and learn about some of the local networks and services that you've got. Manchester's a fantastic example. There are others around the country. I do quite a lot with Nottingham. I've also been to um, Bristol, various other cities and towns looking at their bus and other local transport networks. Um, and I was shadowing this brief before. And I think there's a lot and in various parts of London. I think there's a lot we can learn from each other. So the whole cooperative ethos, I think, has got a massive amount to offer. And we should be looking at trying to, in my opinion, um, understanding the very best around the country and bringing it all together. And sometimes, I mean, going back to Manchester or parts of London, that might also be about understanding how walking and cycling link to um, local bus services and community buses um, and how better footpaths, even for people who've got a disability for mobility vehicles as well, can be linked into local um, services for community transport. Um, so I'm very keen to look into that. Um, in terms of the opportunities offered by franchising, I think you're right, there's a whole range of opportunities. I should say that there are a number of other um, mayoral areas that are starting to look at franchising, which you might have picked up on. So in um, Liverpool, they're very excited by it. Also, the new um, Dan Jarvis is the mayor for um, South Yorkshire. We've got the possibility of um, Liam Byrne being elected this time next year um, in the West Midlands, which would be a huge coup if we could achieve it. It's, difficult, it's harder there for various reasons, but I think that's a really exciting prospect as well. And there's loads of drive and energy in Birmingham to try to change their um, local transport network. Um, the mayoral team Bristol as well, there's also possibilities there. So um, I very much like to put people in touch with some of the mayors and also in the Northeast and indeed um, in other parts of the country and to get a discussion going on that front and to try to see franchising, which is quite a long-term development. And I think Andy's team are talking, they're thinking about the early 2020s, aren't they, rather than right now. But there are some really exciting possibilities for community transport as part of that. Um, and in terms of uh, developing models, I really would like to start to see some, some options emerging. Um, and as you were saying, Bill, integration, very important. Understanding how a community-based approach could be linked to other services, as I mentioned earlier, it's also central. So if we can pick up on all those things, I would be delighted to work with you. Please email me and ring me. Um, I'm keen to get out and about and invite me to your part of the country. So thanks again for inviting me and I'm happy to take any questions as well. Fabulous, and that, that's certainly an offer we will be keen to take you up on. And it's such a lovely uh, thing to hear so many parts of the country with cooperative metro mayors or, or cooperative metro mayor candidates. So we're, we're pleased to be part of um, helping uh, make buses better. I've had a few questions in advance. Um, I'll read a couple out because um, there are some where we've had questions on similar things and maybe while we do that I'll sort through the others. I've had a couple of people get in touch around accessibility on buses so whether that's um, on uh, community transport or on general um, bus networks both in terms of improving accessibility why that doesn't there doesn't seem to be sort of strong enough standards but also around um, so someone talks about bus driver people relationship skills and why we need to be focusing around bus driver recruitment on more than just the ability to, to drive a bus. So I don't know if um, on accessibility issues, Bill or um, Matt, you had a, a thought you wanted to hop in on. Bill, I can't unmute you. You're, I think you might need to unmute yourself. Lovely. Yeah, uh, certainly in terms of accessibility, uh, I mean, there's a view if you make the mainstream uh, so accessible, do you need alternative specialist provision? Um, I think you always will need some element of it. Um, so yeah, there's been various initiatives uh, to change uh, the standards of vehicles, some of the infrastructure around uh, stations and bus stops uh, hasn't necessarily uh, gone far enough. It also focuses on physical disabilities as well. Um, we know from some of you mentioned training that both training drivers to understand a full range of disabilities, but also think more broadly around things like mental health um, is beneficial. It exists and it is beneficial where it takes place. We also have travel training where um, 
certain CT operators will uh, provide training to groups of individuals, particularly young adults with learning disabilities who you know, might want to uh, go and get a, a job, don't feel comfortable, confident using public transport, um, but there's training there that supports them to feel more confident and to, to navigate their way around public transport. So all the building blocks are there. Um, it comes down to sort of how strongly the regulatory powers enforce them. Um, and, you know, we would support anything, uh, any initiative that's about sort of growing uh, the accessibility of the transport network, in including community transport, because, you know, I wouldn't say that you know, in all circumstances, uh, everything will be as accessible as it could be. So. Great. And um, Matt, was there anything else you wanted to come in on, on accessibility? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, I think that the way to look at this is the overall priority that's given to accessibility and the um, emphasis that's put on uh, transport as a way of enabling um, disabled people to lead a full and active life. Um, so I think there should be a much greater emphasis on it as a result. And at the moment, there's progress being made, but a lot more could be done. And you can see that in some um, parts of the country, it's been a higher priority. Um, in the area that I live in, we're lucky with a municipal company to have um, a bit more emphasis in our mainstream bus network on um, accessibility. Um, and they were relatively early adopters of things like um, audio announcements for stops and various other things. But there's a lot more that can be done. And I think we ought to be honest as a country to accept that and to think that a lot of transport infrastructure is actually quite um, unfriendly to disabled people, particularly the rail network. And there's a need for a lot of infrastructure investment. And we um, would like as an incoming government to put a lot more money into these sorts of things. Um, so that, that's really the points I would add to kind of give some wider context to it. Fabulous. And I had a question from Jeff Walker. Jeff, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm Jeff Walker. I'm the Cabinet Member of Southern City Council for Health and Wellbeing. And, uh, I'm interested in integrated budgets simply because in health and wellbeing we're under considerable pressure for something that I've supported for a long time is to integrate health and social care budgets. And I think if we integrated those budgets we'd be going some way to alleviate some of the problems with social care at the moment. So I was wondering what your thoughts were about how community transport would fit within an integrated public service budget if we come across such a thing. Fabulous and thanks for the shortness. Um, okay, I think it can work. Uh, community transport operators will be providing uh, a range of services to health settings, social care settings, um, take people into education, but actually they'll all be funded slightly differently by different bits of local public bodies. So integration of those uh, budgets certainly would be beneficial. Um, I also think that sort of getting a sense that the public purse has already invested in some of these services and could get more from them. In many organisations, there will be unused capacity at some point. So, for example, a local council might have paid for some home to school transport, and those buses don't do anything till it's from when they drop the kids off to when they're going to be picked up at three o'clock or half three. Actually, they're, they're community assets, they could be put to work. Um, so, with some additional funding that enables them to maybe do some patient transport or whatever. Um, in, in the downtime, you know, it makes sense. And that's what the total transport approach is, that you actually try and make better use of unused capacity across a, a range of provision. Um, and uh, the way I would say, you, you know, if you've invested in uh, one local service, then getting full value for the public purse from that uh, seems like a, a good option. Great. Matt, any views on how we could better integrate local budgets? Um, I think actually Bill's already hit on the main point, which is we ought to be making better value use of these assets. Um, and it's really important. And we haven't got a lot of assets anyway. And we're likely to face another period of austerity after the virus, I'm afraid. Can I bring in one other point, actually? I think somebody Please. raised the issue about bus driver training as an, as an important um, way of promoting bus use. There's a lot of evidence to show that actually polite and um, friendly and helpful bus drivers actually um, are a key part in developing a bus service. And in the parts of the country where there's a growing uh, mainstream bus service, not um, necessarily this isn't necessarily the community sector, but I'm sure it applies. Having bus, bus drivers who are well trained is part of that package that attracts um, uh, bus usage. So I'd, I'd strongly recommend that as well. Fab. And I'm going to 
call on Kim Snape now. Kim, I'm going to unmute you. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name's Kim Snape. I'm a councillor in Chorley in Lancashire. You've touched on some of the really innovative stuff that's progressing in Greater Manchester and Merseyside. But we kind of feel a bit left behind in Lancashire. We're kind of nestled between Greater Manchester and Merseyside. But in terms of transport, we're kind of lagging because we don't have a combined transport authority um, at Orham Air. And we were just wondering, what's your views on sort of progressing towards a regional passenger transport executive, really? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Because obviously more people are now living more regionally, more than what they've ever done, really. Anna, would you mind if I came in first, just because I'm about to run out of battery on my Don't phone. it. Oh, goodness. Right, right. in which case, let's hear from you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh. Oh. Uh, okay, maybe Bill, hop in and while, while Matt finds a charger. Um, as I said before, the... Um, they have you know, the, what was in mind when things like the Bus Services Act was generated was for these to be powers for metropolitan mayors. So it's a good question, Kim. You know, well, how, what does this mean for me living in a county council? I guess it's about creating a logical footprint that feels like a place to people. I know there was some issues around regional government. You know, people don't necessarily feel part of you know the northeast or or the East Midlands, um, but actually might feel connect, more connected to an area. So it may be that, firstly, thinking at county level, actually doing, you know, if, if it's not big enough for a county, are we part of that city region of Greater Manchester and could we be included in that? Or could we combine with two or three neighbouring counties that find them, you know, actually, if you put Lancashire and Cumbria um, together, could you actually create a viable size, you know, footprint? in which a, a kind of network and combined authority could be created. I know in some areas, the combined authorities are, you know, the, the districts that are in the county council area, plus any of the unitary. So bringing those kind of bigger urban areas that might be split off from the county council under the umbrella of the combined authority uh, is a good thing to look at as well, um, particularly for transport. I know in Hampshire, Hampshire County Council, you know, it, its biggest cities and areas of public transport are outside of the county council because they're in, you know, the, the unitary authorities. Um, but actually they do integrate those um, for organising some transport. So that might be something to look at as well. Great. I think Matt's still looking for a charger, so we'll, we'll come back to him. And in the meantime, I will pull in Angarad. There we go, you're unmuted. Hi, thanks. I'm Angharad Roberts. I'm um, a councillor in Nottingham. Um, I'm just wondering what your views are on the support which is being provided by the government at the moment to bus operators um, in relation to COVID-19 and how bus operators will respond in the longer term in terms of when we know what the exit strategy is for the lockdown and how attitudes towards using buses and other forms of public transport might be affected by the pandemic. Great, thank you. Um, and I also had a question from um, Brenda Weston, who wasn't able to join, but I know is, is keen to catch up after, is around if you've got any examples, Bill, of councils that incorporate and commission community transport as part of local transport plans and how we might work with, I seem to keep picking councillors, like, it's not deliberate, honestly, uh, but we have a lot of co-op councillors. Um, given we've got lots of cooperative councillors, how can we make sure community transport is in local transport plans? Yeah. So on the uh, investment to, or that's being made to support bus operators, if you think about what, well, what, what's the big issue for, for a bus operator at the moment, one is uh, massively dwindling revenues because so much of their business model is about what comes through fares. Um, so, so that's an issue. But then there's also in order to uh, run essential services. They've had to take fewer passengers on their vehicles so that people can sit socially distanced. And then there's a real concern, 
certainly amongst the uh, trade unions uh, around the safety of drivers and, and how they're protected. And I know in Nottingham, there's uh, somebody who drives for Nottingham Community Transport, sadly died one of their drivers. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's a very real issue. Um, how much the money will help, it will certainly alleviate uh, some of those funding pressures. Um, but it was a market that kind of was, as I explained at the start of my presentation, that was bumping along the bottom in some respects anyway, in that the business model, which was called a kind of a free market and you know run by commercial operators, still relies on a heavy amount of state subsidy through bus service operators grant, uh, concessionary fares, and those kind of things. So I think all those issues and dynamics are still going to be there, but probably felt worse and, you know, might accelerate some of the conversations about how things need to change uh, within those markets. Does that answer your question, Angarid? Uh, I think she's still muted. Um, I think we might have Matt back. So I am just uh, searching for him. Um, the unmute. Um, Matt, is that you? That's me, yeah. Ah, oh, fabulous. Welcome back. Um, we're we're going to wrap up, I think, um, very shortly, but just in case you, you missed them, we had a, a question around whether the government emergency support for buses um, during COVID-19 um, is suitable for meeting the longer term challenges. So, so is it enough now and is it going to enable the, our buses to um, meet the changes in way people use buses and, and general changes in our economy post pandemic and then also a query around how um, we can better integrate community transport in local transport plans um, and then i'll probably wrap it up um, and anyone who sent me questions i will pass on to our speakers so that they they're sort of cognizant of the kinds of issues people want to talk about Okay, so um, on the first one, I think the answer to the first question is probably for the moment, but with a big um, caveat that we might need more money if the um, lockdown continues. And there's also likely to be a very long period of slow recovery afterwards. Um, different bus operators have described it to me as being rather like the 2008 crash, that it's going to take some years for the bus market to respond after this crisis, because not only will they have a period when there's going to be uh, heavy uh, social distancing, um, but then people would get out of the habit of bus travel. There's also been, I mean, I think also it's worth considering the effect on retail, um, physical retail of the um, of the virus and, and the, um, the way that that's probably accelerated the decline of um, people shopping by going to town and city centres. And I think that does give us a very real problem for the bus industry um, because many, many of the um, journeys that people are making to go shopping, um, uh, there's a similar issue potentially with home working as well, that whilst it's a very good thing, it could have an impact on the volume of bus travel. So the operators are expecting a long, slow recovery. Um, and so if the government support continues to some extent, um, rather than just at the moment it's for three months, that would probably help to, to quite a great deal. Um, but the, the way forward is um, unclear at the moment. We're certainly pushing for... Um, support for all the um, different parts of the transport sector. And we've been ple relatively pleased with um, the support for um, buses and rail and a lot less pleased with the support for trams and certainly for aviation has been really poor. Um, and we obviously want to protect people's jobs and protect the environment. In terms of the longer term transition, um, I think that's it, it's really too early to say, but there's a, a lot of capital money needed to um, invest in electric vehicles. There are other changes. Um, I think there's also a big need for just wider investment in buses as a whole. I'm not sure really if the current government really understands the scale of the need and quite how much um, bus service has been cut since 2010. And uh, huge numbers of routes have been cut. 45% cut in funding since 2010. That's the scale of um, the effects of austerity. Um, I'm really lucky in representing an area that, which is one of half a dozen in, in England and a couple in Wales that have got uh, municipal bus companies so they're, they're able to some extent to be a, a little bit more um, independent but still that the effects of um, austerity are very harsh across the country and I think that, that that's um, a lot of ground to make up and then we've obviously got this issue of trying to um, make transport much more um, environmentally friendly so 
yes, short term, probably okay. If the um, lockdown continues and the long uh, recovery, we, we need probably more um, work on how to support bus services, and certainly more work on transition. Great, and I'm glad that there's been lots of mention of the uh, Reading buses because I was reading an article when you were first promoted to your shadow role that said it was a perfect fit for the man who used to be a councillor <laughs> on a council which owned Reading buses. So um, I feel oh, like that's a suitable, that. suitable shout out today. Um, oh, and that's I think very nice of you. <laughs> on that, I'm, I'm going to wrap up today's because um, I've kept you all uh, for the majority of your lunch break and you'll all be needing your sandwiches um, but thank you so much this is a record zoom call for us um, we had 85 people on our call which is fabulous um, some really interesting questions and I am really sorry there's lots of questions we haven't had a chance to get to I'm going to put them together um, and make sure that they go to Matt and Bill so that they know what we're talking about um, and that offer of, of, of being able to share your contact details Matt would be wonderful so I think yes. sort of compiling examples of good practice or particular challenges you're facing in your area, uh, finding examples of your local community transport organisations and seeing what help they need um, would be great. It's lovely to see so many councillors on our call. Um, so if you have a community transport operator in your area and if you don't know, um, the Community Transport Association I think has a directory or you'll be able to find out from Bill, um, getting in touch and finding out whether they have everything they need during the crisis and if you can support them in your capacity as a local councillor would be a great short-term action to take um, and uh, you can all uh, come out of this crisis as volunteer bus drivers hopefully um, this is the topic of one of our policy consultations we consult on policy uh, through the spring um, to the summer we put something together uh, new policy ideas and, and bring them to conference in the autumn and we're looking at connecting communities which has buses and community broadband it's very hard so we'll be making sure that we work closely with Matt and Jim and others in the shadow transport team to help get all of your ideas into the mix on, on Labour's thinking on, on transport and buses because um, I know it's a really important issue to all of you so I will also circulate the policy pages where you're able to upload your own thoughts individually and um, lots of questions there about how we can a make it easier to be a community transport operator but b create a situation where we don't have private companies profiting off the, the good routes and leaving the, the bad routes for the community to pick up the pieces. Um, so please send through your thoughts and questions. And on that, I uh, will see you next week. Councillors, we have a call at 6 p.m. with Steve Reed if you are available. Um, and the rest of you, I hope to see you next Wednesday. And in the meantime, please look after yourselves and stay home. Bye everyone, thank you.